Uh, Masonic scholars have long complained that historians ignore the impact of Freemasonry, uh, even though they should cover the complete scope of all the fields which influenced or were influenced by Freemasonry and where Freemasonry or Freemasons played a role. Some of the same scholars have observed that Mormon historians in particular have neglected Masonic influences on the religion and rituals. Arthur de Hoyas has pointedly critiqued Mormons that rely on a, quote, uncritical school, close quote, to persuade members of the LDS Church that Freemasonry has existed for thousands of years and that their temple endowment ritual is an authentic restoration of ancient practices rather than an acknowledged, uh, quote, borrowing from Freemasonry, close quote. Similarly, two prominent British Masonic scholars have concluded that Mormon historians refuse to address this topic because, quote, Mormonism perpetuates and practices anti-Masonry, perhaps the only body to do so for reasons of self-preservation. Such criticisms uh, provide a challenge to Mormon and non-Mormon historians to not only acknowledge the dynamic relationship between Freemasonry and Mormonism, but also to reevaluate Joseph Smith's mistaken belief, which was shared by many of his contemporaries, that Freemasonry had ancient origins and that it could trace its rituals back to Solomon's temple. Joseph's temple, the dynamic relationship between Freemasonry and Mormonism, as the title suggests, is my attempt to respond to such criticisms and to discuss not only the relationships between Mormonism and Masonry, but also suggest the reasons that Mormon scholars have either ignored, glossed over, or distorted uh, the relationship. During the next few minutes, uh, I will review the historiography of this topic as it relates uh, to the Mormon temple ritual, uh, because the relationship extends to uh, many other topics uh, within Mormonism, which are discussed in the book, uh, which demonstrate that Smith and his inner circle and his immediate successors, who like Smith became Freemasons shortly before the ritual was introduced, believed that Freemasonry's rituals preserved a partial bastardized version of a temple ritual practiced in Solomon's temple. They also believed that Smith's endowment, which he received by revelation, was a complete restoration of Solomon's right, and that there were therefore similarities between the Masonic and Mormon rituals. Ironically, when the Mormon leadership began its quest to mainstream its image, which coincided with the death of most of Mormon uh, Masons and the abandonment of plural marriage, the church constructed a new thesis that there were no real connections between Freemasonry and Mormonism. Instead, uh, they claim that Smith received a revelation in which the entire endowment was revealed to him several years before he became a Freemason. And when he did join the craft, he did so only to make friends and was never an active member of, of the, his lodge. Joseph Smith, the first Mormon prophet, was, uh, on the contrary, quite transparent with his inner circle when he introduced a new temple ritual in 1842 in Nauvoo concerning the connections with Masonic rituals. Willard Richards, who was Smith's scribe and an apostle, wrote to his brother Levi on the same day that Smith uh, was initiated as an entered apprentice that, quote, Masonry had its origin in the priesthood, a hint to the wise is sufficient. Another Mormon, James Cumming, made a similar disclosure to his family that was recorded many years later, that when Smith was initiated into Freemasonry, he, quote, seemed to understand some of the features of the Masonic ceremonies better than any other Mason, and made explanations that rendered them much more beautiful and full of meaning. <clears throat> Within a week of his initiation into Freemasonry, Smith received, uh, revealed during a sermon that there were, quote, certain key words and signs belonging to the priesthood, which must be observed in order to obtain blessings. And less than six weeks later, he revealed that the signs and words to detect false prophets and personages, or false spirits, excuse me, and personages would not be revealed in the tel until the temple was completed. There were signs in the heaven, he said, earth and hell, 
which elders must know to be endowed with power. Although the devil knows many signs, he did not know the sign of Jesus. No one can truly say he knows God until he has handled something, and this can only be in the holiest of holies. Less than six weeks later, Smith introduced a restored temple ritual to eight men, all master masons, which he referred to as the Holy Order. Shortly thereafter, the Mormon prophet told the officers of Nauvoo Lodge that, quote, I have done what King Solomon, King Hiram, and Hiramith could not do. I have set up the kingdom no more to be thrown down forever, nor, ever, nor never to be given to another people. Members of the Holy Order privately acknowledged that there were parallels between the endowment and the Masonic ritual. Heber C. Kimball, a charter member of the Holy Order, wrote a letter to his fellow apostle Parley P. Pratt that he was initiated, that when he was initiated, the Mormon prophet taught that there was, quote, similarity of priesthood in masonry, and that Freemasonry was taken from the priesthood, but has become degenerated. Similarly, Joseph Fielding, Hiram Smith's brother-in-law, and Hiram, of course, was Joseph Smith's brother, and heir apparent uh, at the time of the death, at the time of his death, but he was killed with him, wrote shortly after joining the Holy Order in December 1843 that many have joined the Masonic Institution, and this seems to have been a stepping stone or preparation for something else, the true origin of masonry. This I have also seen and rejoice in it. Benjamin Johnson, another uh, Mormon who married William and Lucinda Morgan's daughter, uh, who is uh, Lucinda Morgan, who is William Morgan's uh, widow, uh, joined the LDS Church uh, in Ohio. Uh, and uh, this fellow married the daughter, who was also married, uh, who was also named Lucinda, and received his endowment in the Nauvoo Temple. Wrote in April 1843 that Smith quote gave me such ideas pertaining to endowments as he thought proper, and assured him that quote Freemasonry as at present was the apostate endowments, as sectarian religion was the apostate religion. Brigham Young and other church leaders who succeeded Smith continued to acknowledge the connection between Masonic rituals and the Mormon endowment, even though the Illinois Grand Lodge rescinded the Mormon Lodge's dispensations, and most Mormons believed that the mob which killed Smith and his brother included Masons who had ignored the Mormon prophet's use of the Masonic stress call, distress call. Young's closest friend in the hierarchy, Heber C. Kimball, who became a Mason before he joined Mormonism, rejoiced that, quote, I have been as true as an angel from the heavens to the covenants I have made in my lodge at Victor, Victor, New York. During the same period, Brigham Young was photographed with a Masonic pin, and this is after they're in Utah, by the way, and the church utilized and displayed Masonic symbols on church buildings, cooperatives, grave markers, newspaper mastheads, hotels, residences, coins, logos, and seals. In addition, the Mormon hierarchy publicly explained for the first time the parallels between the endowment and Masonic ritual, which they had privately acknowledged for more than 16 years. In 1858, Heber C. Kimball insisted that we have true masonry, and that masonry of today is received from the apostasy which took place in the days of Solomon and David and he emphasized the need for secrecy. You have received your endowments, he said. What is it for? To learn you to hold your tongues. Brigham Young made similar statements from the pulpit. I could preach all about endowments in public and the world know nothing about it, the Mormon prophet said. I could preach all about masonry and none but a mason know anything about it, Young noted. After mentioning this link, he said, the main part of masonry is to keep a secret. Despite the Mormons' continued reverences for Freemasonry, the first lodges which were established by United States uh, soldiers in Utah Territory and by non-Mormon merchants refused to allow Mormon Masons to visit their lodges. The primary reason they gave was that the Mormons were engaged in the illegal practice of polygamy. Brigham Young felt so strongly about this snub that he attacked Utah Masonry's rationale for excluding Mormons and reconfirmed his belief that King Solomon 
had introduced the first Masonic rituals in Jerusalem. Young complained that Mormons, quote, cannot be admitted into their social societies, into their places of gathering at certain times and on certain occasions because they are afraid of polygamy, close quote. Then he noted with a tinge of sarcasm, quote, they have refused our brethren membership in their lodge because they were polygamous. Who was the founder of Freemasonry? They can go back as far as Solomon and there they stop. There is the king who establishes high and holy order. Now, was he a polygamist or was he not? The Mormon prophet noted that if Solomon, quote, did believe in monogamy, he did not practice it a great deal, for he had 700 wives, and that is more than I have. And he had 300 concubines, of which I have none that I know of. He then told the gathering that if polygamy was, quote, one of the relics of barbarism, close quote, that it was also, quote, one of the relics of Adam, of Enoch, of Noah, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Moses, David, Solomon, the prophets, of Jesus, and his apostles. When Young dedicated the first Mormon temple constructed in Utah 15 years later, he exulted that the temple was only the fourth temple in the history of the world in which rituals restored by Joseph Smith could be practiced and noted that even in Jerusalem, the full ritual was never revealed since the high priest, Hiram Abiff, whose legend was revealed in the Master Mason degree, was killed before he could reveal the, the Mason's word to initiates. For more than 25 years after Young's death, church authorities continued to advance Smith's thesis that Masonry was a perversion of, primitive, of a primitive ritual which had been restored to its fullness. It was only after the LDS Church abandoned plural marriage that Masons began asserting that Smith had purloined their rituals and created a spurious form of Masonry as an additional rationale of excluding all Mormons from their lodges. During the same period, most of the Mormons who had been initiated into Freemasonry in Nauvoo had died, and the new generation of church officials became increasingly uncomfortable comparing the Mormon endowment and Masonic rituals. Thereafter, church officials gradually developed a new thesis concerning its, the connection. In October 1913, Melvin J. Ballard, a Mormon mission president, acknowledged during LDS conference that Freemasonry was, quote, a fragment of the old truth coming down perhaps from Solomon's temple of ancient days. But he broke with prior church leaders by maintaining that Smith received the entire endowment while the church was still in Nauvoo. According to Ballard, Joseph Smith never knew the first thing of masonry until years after he received the visits of Elijah and had delivered to men the keys of the holy priesthood and the ceremonies and ordinances had by us in sacred temples and had given the endowments to men long before he knew the first thing pertaining to the ordinances and ceremonies of masonry. When Ballard became an apostle six years later, he reconfirmed that, quote, modern masonry is a fragmentary presentation of the ancient order established by King Solomon from whom it is said to be handed down through the centuries, and that, quote, the temple plan revealed to Joseph Smith was the perfect Solomonic plan under which no man was permitted to obtain the secrets of masonry unless he also held the holy priesthood. But he also claimed, as he had in his prior speech, that the plans for the ordinances to be observed in the temple built at Nauvoo were revealed to Joseph Smith more than a year prior to the time the founder of the Mormon church became a member of the Masonic order. Thereafter, other church officials introduced an even more nuanced thesis. In 1920, John A. Whitsell, who had become an apostle the following year, delivered a lecture in which he described the endowment as, quote, the preparatory ordinances, the giving of instructions by lectures and representations, covenants, and finally, tests of knowledge. Witso noted that Joseph Smith received the temple endowment and ritual, quote, by revelation from God, and that it can best be understood by revelation. The following year, Brigham H. Roberts, a member of the First Council of Seventy, answered an inquiry concerning the Prophet Joseph Smith's connection with masonry and its connection with temple ceremonies and to the endowment rites having been copied for masonry, which was published in the Improvement Era. 
the editors of the Improvement Era, which was a church periodical, by the way, era magazine, also noted that it received frequent questions concerning the same topic. Roberts maintained that Smith began to receive revelations concerning the endowment in 1835, and keep in mind that he was not, uh, did not become a Mason until 1842, uh, when he obtained possession of, quote, the Egyptian papyrus manuscript, which included facsimile to which, according to Smith's translations, made references to keywords and to the holy temple of God. Roberts wrote that these references referred to the sacred mysteries of our temple ordinances and all this from five to seven years before the prophet's contact with masonry. During this same period, Utah Masons continued to impose uh, the opening of their temples to Mormons. Sam Henry Goodwin, a past Grand Master and Chairman of the Grand Lodge Committee on Correspondence in Utah, responded to the Mormons' revised thesis and developed additional rationales for excluding Mormons. Goodwin realized that the original rationale for excluding Mormons, that they were polygamists and therefore lawbreakers, had become anachronistic, and the rationale for refusing visitation rights to Mormon Masons, because they were initiated in Nauvoo, made no sense because they were all dead. Nevertheless, he was also convinced that Utah Masonry's exclusionary policy which prevented most of the male population in Utah from joining Freemasonry, should also be preserved because the craft continued to thrive as a counterpoint to Mormon domination. From 1890 to 1920, the number of Master Masons in Utah increased more than sevenfold, uh, from 486 in seven lodges to 3,690 in 21 lodges. In 1920 alone, 669 new Masons, all non-Mormons, were initiated in Utah lodges. As such, Goodwin was prepared to advance a new rationale which would update uh, these uh, policies. Goodwin uh, discussed the significant teachings of Mormonism, which included absolute obedience to the priesthood, the discontinued practice of polygamy, belief in continuing revelation, and what he characterized as the Latter-day Saints' belief in a plurality of gods. He noted that the LDS hierarchy discouraged Mormons from joining Freemasonry or any other fraternal organization, and concluded that this being true, it must follow that a member of that organization who would join the fraternity in direct opposition to the positive declarations of church officials would necessarily be a bad Mormon. Based on this background, Goodwin unveiled Utah Masonry's new rationale for prohibiting Mormons from entering Freemasonry, which reflected his religious orientation. He argued that there were nine reasons for excluding Mormons from Masonry even after the abandonment of polygamy, which included the attitude of Nauvoo Masons toward Masonic customs and law, uh, the uh, former practice of polygamy, the attitude toward uh, American law, liability to answer one question in petition, i.e. that he does not believe in the principles of polygamy, substitution of living oracles for the Bible, male and female deity out of harmony with that of the uh, Anglo-Saxon masonry, on and on and on. Although Goodwin admitted that polygamy did not have the importance for a mason and citizen that it once had when he was the Grand Secretary initially established, the exclusionary policy. Uh, he argued that the Mormons' uh, 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 ceremony in the temples, uh, which at that time were located uh, per particularly in Utah, uh, disqualified all Mormons thereafter from becoming uh, uh, Freemasons. And I'm gonna skip through some of this because uh, I think we're running out of time here. Yes. While the Grand Lodge formalized its exclusionary policy and adopted Sam Goodwin's new rationales for excluding Mormons from Utah Masonry, the Mormon leadership continued to refine the new basis which explained parallels between Masonic rituals and the endowment. And just to summarize, those essentially were that Joseph Smith received the entire endowment through revelation and that there were no environmental influences on that revelation, i.e. no indicia of Mormon influence. Then let me, uh, that became institutionalized by the church 
uh, exactly uh, 80 years ago this year, in 1934. And then let me uh, fast forward uh, to uh, some developments since then, and then I'll, I'll finish up. Uh, Forty years ago uh, this year, uh, a church instructor named Reed C. Durham, who was director of the LDS Institute of Religion at the University of Utah, delivered his presidential address to the Mormon History Association in Nauvoo, Illinois, in which he startled his Orthodox audience when he concluded that the Mormon temple ceremony had an immediate inspiration for masonry and that most of the things which were developed in the church at Nauvoo were inextricably interwoven with Freemasonry. And of course, the audience was aghast, and I can assure you, I'm, we're heading to the Mormon History Association after this presentation in San Antonio. They will not be celebrating the 40th anniversary of uh, Durham's presentation. Of course, he was censured. The speech was never published. Uh, underground accounts of the speech uh, were published. Uh, subsequent to that time, the uh, uh, institutional uh, thesis concerning Freemasonry and Mormon was republished in the Encyclopedia of uh, Mormonism. Since that time, uh, most Mormon historians who have addressed this topic have recognized that Smith's thinking was affected by his environment, something that the thesis denied, even if the final ritual was a product of revelation, which is also consistent with the thesis. Richard Bushman, in his biography of Joseph Smith, noted that Smith was intrigued by the Masonic rites when the Nauvoo Lodge was organized and that he turned the materials to his own uses in the temple endowment. Uh, at the present time, the debate really is over the significance of the connections as opposed to whether or not there uh, really were connections. The dynamic relation, and let me just finish up with a couple of paragraphs and then I'll sit down. Uh, the dynamic relationship between Freemasonry and Mormonism remains relevant even in the 21st century. The worldwide Mormon population is approaching 15 million, and many of these members participate in the Mormon endowment in more than 130 temples. The number is growing in the Americas, Europe, Asia, Australia, and Africa. The number of Masons, on the other hand, in the United States is approximately 2 million, with perhaps another 2 to 3 million in the rest of the world. It is therefore ironic that the predictions of some 19th century American Masons that all Christians would eventually practice Masonic rituals has been realized uh, within the narrow context of Mormonism more than it has in the co traditional Christian denominations, uh, some of which continue to counsel their members against joining the craft. This development is less surprising when one considers that Joseph Smith imported a Masonic-like ritual into his hierarchical church and taught that it was a heavenly sanctioned and included keys which literally, not just allegorically, enabled initiates to pass through sentinels into the presence of God. American masonry at the same time that Joseph Smith did so uh, was uh, reinventing itself uh, by emphasizing inclusivity, demanding its Christian connections be no longer emphasized and no longer claiming ancient origins. The degree to which Smith's new ritual was based on inspiration is suggested by Mormon scholars as opposed to his extrapolations of Masonic ritual is ultimately a question of faith. But while Joseph's temple was neither a literal restoration of Solomon's temple, nor was its ritual merely a pirated copy of Masonic rites, the first two Mormon prophets did use the same Masonic formula and advanced some of the same teachings which were developed uh, during the previous 100 years in England, France, and America. Although the common aspirations of 19th century Masons and Mormons to graft Masonic-like rituals into otherwise ritualist churches has had, a long, has had a long lasting implications for Mormon policies concerning gender and race it has also provided church members with a separate sacred space to receive illumination concerning a pathway to return to God's presence. Thank you very much.